Now I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker as a former mayor and a leader in the United States Senate. He understands the challenges of creating education and career opportunities, even in a difficult political climate. He's committed to working across the aisle to tackle the big issues facing us, and he has championed critical legislation on the very issue we're discussing today. He's particularly passionate about and committed to making sure young adults succeed in America. Join me in welcoming Senator Cory Booker. Thank, thank you so much. Here. Are you kidding me? Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Are you guys awake? Yeah. Uh, pumped up? So let me start my remarks with a story um, uh, after, first of all, I want to give gratitude to everybody that, for coming here this morning, to Opportunity Nation. This is an incredible summit, and if I would think of what's important going on in Washington right now, uh, of all the things going on in Washington right now, uh, a manufactured debate over funding the Department of Homeland Security, uh, no, this is the most important thing going on right now. Look, there's a wonderful story uh, that is uh, highly apocryphal, but it's about a church that a uh, pastor was having a really difficult time. These two young people were cutting up in class time and time again, cutting up in, in Bible study, cutting up in the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the congregation. And so the pastor had everybody try to talk to him, the head of the deacons, try to get them to behave. They wouldn't behave. The head of the choir, they wouldn't behave. And so finally, he's, you know, like, if you got to want to think done, you've got to do it yourself. So he takes these two boys, young boys, brothers, brings them down to his uh, office, sits the youngest one outside, brings the older one into his office, and sits him down. And the boy is being very disrespectful. He's got his arms crossed, staring down the pastor. The pastor's sitting behind his desk, uh, uh, staring at him and, and, and thinking to himself, everybody else has tried this. Let me try a different way of going about getting through them. And, and so he sees his big Bible there on the desk. He rubs his Bible and thinks to himself, I'm going to do this differently. Okay. And he looks at the boy hard and says, my son, tell me, where is God? And at that point, the kid's eyes opened up, snapped to attention. His, his whole demeanor changed. And the pastor thought to himself, oh, my God, I'm getting through to him. Maybe this is the way to go. So he, he picks up his, his Bible and, and, and now holds it in his hands and says, uh, in, in his ministerial voice, he says, my son, I don't know if you heard me, where is God? And at this point, the boy starts to shake and his hands grab the, the, the armrest and the, the pastor's thinking to myself, I'm getting through. And I don't know what, what kind of religious institution you all may or may not go to, but when my pastor sees something working, he just doubles down on it. And, <laughs> and so this pastor stands up his big uh, body, his deep baritone voice, the boy sitting there shaking, looking scared, and the pastor now waves the Bible, and he says with his Sunday sermon voice, he says, my son, I don't know if you heard me, I said, uh, where is God? And at this point, the boy jumps up out of his chair, sprints past the pastor, shoots out of the office, sees his little brother sitting there, grabs him by the hand and says, man, we got to get out of here. God is missing, and the pastor thinks we took him. I say this convoluted joke not only because I, I, I want to run the risk of never getting invited back again, um, but, you know, I get confused because we see the challenges in our nation at times and we often wonder uh, out loud, you know, where is God? Where, where, where are the people that are going to solve this problem? We wonder and ask questions but not realize that the question isn't where is God or some other force or government. The real question is where are we? We live in a country that has proven time and time again, American history is a perpetual testimony to the achievement of the impossible. We have demonstrated our ability to do anything that we want to do. When we focus on it, whether it's zeroing in and mapping the human genome or going out and landing on the moon, that when we decide as a country to focus our genius, our resource on a problem, we can solve it. And we say time and time again that we stand for these values, opportunity for all, liberty for all, justice for all. But when we stop now and give an honest assessment of where we stand, we are not living up to those values. And it's not a matter of can we do that, it's a matter of do we have the collective will. And so this idea that, that we have, 
that this should be a nation where every one of our people should be able to fulfill their highest potential. We need to recommit ourselves because more than ever before, compared to our international peers, we're falling behind. This used to be the top nation in the globe for if you want to be born poor and make it into the middle class, be born in America, but that's not the case anymore. It's better to be born in Canada or England or Germany if you want to go from poverty to the middle class. That should get all of our competitive juices flowing. This used to be the country to be born into if you wanted to get a higher education. But now this country is falling behind our global competitors. We're not number one with young people anymore. We're not number five. We're not number 10. We're out of the top 10 for higher education, percentage of our population going to college. And, and, and metrics that are important, we see losing ground constantly. Just the cost of education alone. Germany, 4% of, of their median income to go to college. England, 5 to 6 uh, excuse me, Canada, 5 to 6 England, about 7%. Here in the United States, over 50% of median income to go to college as we cripple a generation of Americans like never before with debt. And so in this environment, we're seeing this idea of disconnected youth emerge. You've talked about the term from last night to now, but let's give it more substance. The truth of the matter in a global knowledge-based economy, the most valuable resource that any nation has is not the fossil fuels in the ground, not coal, not gas, not oil, the most valuable natural resource in a global knowledge-based society that a nation has is its young people. And the flip side of that is to not develop this divine resource has costs. Right now, estimates are in the billions and billions of dollars of the cost to our society for not empowering our youth. In 2011 alone, it was reported that taxpayers bore the burden of $93 billion in compensation for lost taxes and costs related to discon disconnected youth. It's that idea that Langston Hughes says in that poem, what happens to a dream deferred? A dream achieved, we know that in America, but a dream deferred has toxic, even explosive consequences. And in this case, it hurts our economy. At the very time that as I talk to business leaders up and down the state of New Jersey, the one thing they tell me they need is qualified applicants. By 2020, the United States is expected to experience a shortage of 3 million workers with associate's degrees or higher, and 5 million workers with technical certificates and credentials. And the frustrating thing to me is that we as a society, instead of removing barriers to getting our young people into work, and I know there's incredible companies like the speaker before me that are trying to bridge that gap, but we as a society are putting higher and higher walls for our youth to get engaged in the workforce. Let me, let me give you just some examples. Uh, uh, um, among the nearly six million people uh, uh, is a single mother of these disconnected, unemployed youth. There's a single mother who reached out to me who lost her job because she had a sick child young mother had a sick child, and whether she was in Pakistan or Afghanistan or German, Germany or England or Canada or Japan, in fact, every other industrial nation in the world, if your child is sick, they're not going to fire you because you need to spend a few days at home. But we are the one nation that does not have paid family leave. And so what happened to that mother? She, she couldn't she couldn't hold the job and care for that child. So she made the logical choice. She lost her job. Let me give you another example that really, really rankles me. There's a person from Hackensack, New Jersey, who wrote me and told me of, that, that at age 17, he struggled with drug addiction. And as a young man, he served time after being charged with possession of drugs, a felony charge a nonviolent felony charge. 
And now, 10 years later, he kicked the addiction, got training and schools, schooling, advancing his skill. He still struggles today finding work because so many people turn him down because a decade ago he was arrested for drug possession. We have a drug war that has so disproportionately punished our young people for doing things that the last three presidents admitted to doing. In fact, we as taxpayers seem to be so much more comfortable paying a quarter of a trillion dollars a year, locking up more people than anywhere on the planet. The, the nation of liberty and justice is singular in humanity for locking up their fellow citizens. 5% of the globe's population, 25% of the globe's prison population. The majority, over 70% nonviolent offenders, fueled in an explosive way by this so-called drug war that has expanded the federal prison population 800% in the last 30 years alone. And it is disproportionate against poor folks and minorities. We are now having collateral consequences for these young people that follow them their entire life. These entrepreneurs, these geniuses, these people that want to work hard find themselves not able to get business licenses, Pell Grants, jobs because they have former criminal convictions. And so what, what gets me excited is this knowledge that, hey, we have a bad problem with doing so many things that undermine our youth, but we know in America, we know who we are. And so we now as a society have to begin to focus on removing these barriers. In some cases, just catching up with our competitor economies around the globe, doing those common sense things that begin to allow us to capture this invaluable resource that will fuel our economy. Because if I'm gonna bet on anybody, I'm gonna bet on the American worker, I'm gonna bet on American young people. If you give them a little bit of help, they're gonna go a long way. And we in this room that have a capacity to do something, we can't forget the truth of who we are. My dad used to say to me when I'd walk around my house as a boy, he said, boy, don't you dare walk around this house like you hit a triple. You were born on third base. You, you drank deeply from wells of freedom and liberty that you didn't dig. Everybody in this room, we are a, a, a physical manifestation of a conspiracy of love that either ourselves or somebody in our family history, folks went out of their way to do something to get them on track. Everybody in here had a mentor. Everybody in here had some architect that built a bridge for you to walk over a trap. My dad born poor to a single mother, so poor he said, son, I couldn't afford to be poor, I was just po, P-O, I couldn't afford the other two letters. <laughs> Somebody helped him. Folks in a church collection gave him money to get off to college. When he came to Washington, D.C., People weren't hiring black people here. The Urban League stepped up and, and worked with businesses, public-private partnerships to get qualified African-Americans in position. My dad got his first job. All of us are here because of that spirit. Now, I'm in the United States Senate, and uh, I, am, I am focused on attacking uh, 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 these issues. And, and the first thing you have to understand is that coming from being a mayor, I have a simple saying when I was mayor, I used to say, in God we trust, but everybody else bring me data. I, I, don't, I don't care what your philosophy is, what your party is, what your ideology is, show me the numbers. Because as folks in this room know, heroes in this room, some of you I know, I know your programs, I know your nonprofits, I know your public-private partnerships, you have shown that programs can work, but we have to, government, have to get out of the doing stupid. Stupid is funding things that show no evidence of working and re allocating our resources towards proven programs that actually work. We have got to. We have got to have fierce allegiance to results, not ideology, not philosophy, and this means getting over ourselves in Washington. Because we in this 
This nation's capital are not Democrats and Republicans first. We are Americans first, and that should be our focus. And this is why I'm proud to be joining with partners across the aisle to focus on issues affecting disconnected youth. I, I tell you, yesterday I did a radio show with Mike Lee in Utah. I did an interview with Katie Kirk, with, with Rand Paul, and we all sat down for those two interviews and talked about this common scourge of a legal system that is no longer a justice system. And I'm working on legislation like common sense stuff, like sealing of juvenile records so that that nonviolent drug offense that you did when you were 16, 17, 18, or 19 doesn't follow you for the rest of your life. And, and I've joined with a, a, an incredible uh, a United States Senator. Think about this. He is the fifth elected African American ever elected to the United States Senate. I was number four. Some other guy, I forget his name, for, for whatever his name is, was number three. But Tim Scott from South Carolina. People who use a political lens would say the two of us would never sit down together. But we joined together and said, hey, South Carolina is got something going on that is actually beginning to copy what other nations are doing that is so much more ahead of us. That South Carolina is the best state in America in many ways, in many measures, in having apprenticeship programs for young people. Because if you think about it, we are in a situation now where our country is dramatically falling behind in giving the kids the necessary skills and training they need for the jobs of today and tomorrow. When I travel around my state and I talk to businesses like a manufacturer, hey man, what do you need? He looks at me and says, Corey, what we don't need is folks like you with a political science degree, a master's in sociology. Oh, you got a history degree too from Oxford. We don't want you. What we need is machinists and we're willing to pay them 60, 70, $80,000 a year and you don't need, as my father used to say, boy, you got more degrees in the month of July, but you ain't hot. We need to train kids for specific technical jobs. That's why this very day, Senator Tim Scott and I are reintroducing the LEAP Act, or this is Washington Speak, Leveraging Energizing America's Apprenticeship Programs, LEAP. Our act would provide incentives, public-private partnerships, federal tax credits to businesses to develop these apprenticeship programs. The bill incentivizes business owners to invest in our youth I'm proud that we're reintroducing this bill because when I look around the country, I see that other folks are moving ahead of us. In other countries, in fact, we see in Germany where literally half of their kids are in apprenticeship programs. A small nation like England has twice the apprenticeship programs that we have because skill and technical training is so pivotal. I'm gonna continue. I'm going to continue in Washington to fight for common sense things like paid family leave, like attacking the burden of high cost education in this country. A nation that had the GI Bill and the Pell Grant should not be the country now raising the cost of college so much that we have kids that literally are putting aside acceptance letters because they fear they can't afford it. I'm gonna to continue to partner with people like Michael Bennett, who was here last night, and Lamar Alexander, who just are like, wait a minute, the financial aid form, if we held it out here, it would go all the way down to the form, which you have to apply. You actually need a college degree to understand how to figure out and apply for college financial aid. And so we're gonna simplify that form. We introduced legislation, I co-sponsored it, that just reduces that to a postcard that you have to fill out. But I'm telling you, Washington, and Congress does not have all the ideas we need, you do. This is going to be a movement that's going to evidence the truth of this town, which is great change does not come from Washington, it comes to Washington. And so now I challenge you in this room, this is the cause of our country. People in this room will not be called to storm beaches in Normandy. You will not be called to go on freedom rides. But every generation has a calling to do something for which they will be remembered. I do not want to be the country 
that the generation in this country that's remembered for having the percentage of our population growing, going, graduating from college going way down, having the unemployment rate for our youth staying stagnant, having, having the number of our kids getting caught up in the criminal justice system going up. This is not the calling of our country today. The calling of our nation is all of us, independents, Democrats, Republicans, black, white, Latino, Asian, it, it is Jewish, it is Christian, it is Jain, Baha'i, Muslim, all of us who share this common heritage, who drink from the water, who breathe the air of this free country, we have an obligation to tell the world what we stand for, and it is not with our rhetoric. Enough of the shallow patriotism, the call to patriotism is to evidence our truth in how we treat our children. How we treat our children. And that's how I'll end. I began my career as a professional on a street called Martin Luther King Boulevard in Newark, New Jersey. I owe more to that city than I could ever repay. One of the heroes in that city once challenged me. She was the tenant president of Brick Towers, these projects in which I would eventually move and live for eight years. This tenant president who, who challenged me, who showed me that I may have gotten my BA from Stanford, but I got my PhD on the streets of Newark, she challenged me to change my vision. That word vision, we are a nation that when we stand up and say our national anthem, We've got to start not saying these words in rote routine, but feeling them. The very first words are, oh, say, can you see? I stood on that street, Martin Luther King Boulevard, in my very first interactions with her, and she says to me, what do you see in this neighborhood? And I'm telling you right now, it was an impacted inner city community with an abandoned building being used for drugs, with drug dealing, with projects, with graffiti, and I described what I saw to her with this arrogance that I, a young Yale law student, was going to come here and change the world. And this woman looks at me after I described it, and she says, sorry, you can't help me, and she walks away from me. And, and I ran after her. What? Why? And she turns around and looks hard at me and says, why? Because you need to understand something, boy, that the world you see outside of you is a reflection of what you have inside of you. And if you're one of those people who only sees problems and darkness and despair, that's all there's ever going to be. But if you're one of those stubborn people who every time you open your eyes, you see hope, you see opportunity, you see love, you see the face of God, then you can be one of the people that helps me. And she walked away with me staring at my feet, thinking to myself, okay, grasshopper, thus endeth the lesson. <laughs> and so I, I conclude by telling you that is the lesson. What, what do you see when you see our young people? Do you see their race? Do you see their socioeconomic status? Do you see something to feel sorry for? Or do you see their truth? Do you see the face of God instead of asking where is he? Do you see our tomorrow? Do you see angels dancing around them, telling you time and time again that you need them more than they need you? Do you see that they are the fuel of the greatest economy on the planet Earth? Do you see that they're the geniuses that are going to sustain this country and innovation and all of humanity? Do you see promise and potential? What do you see when you look at our kids? And if you see their truth, if you see that clarity, then you got to do something. We don't need more people in this earth getting caught up in a state of sedentary agitation where they see the problems in the world, but they don't get up and do anything to make them change. I tell you this, we need each other, every one of us, and especially our kids, because as that old African-American saying says, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, we got to go together. Thank you.